can you explain how, in your victim statement, you're not allowed to say what you want to say? Well, there's been concern from the beginning when I started picketing that I could taint the jury, but uh, this trial has already been tainted numerous times, and uh, I feel I have as much right to speak as the DA or the defense. Well, let's go p to part of the video recording from when you met with your son's killer, Edward Montour, this past December, along with a moderator who's trained in the method of restorative justice. This clip begins with Edward Montour apologizing to you. And one thing I would like to say before we go further is that I am deeply, deeply sorry for the pain I caused you and your family for killing your son. Um, I had no right. I had no right. Um, and I am very humbled by you forgiving me. And I want to thank you for that because you, you didn't have to. And I'm not sure if I, I would have the courage to do what you're doing. Uh, you're a good man. And I'm... I want to thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, I appreciate that. I wasn't always a good man. You know, this isn't just about me and you, because Eric's right here. My son's over there. My wife is at home. She said she couldn't, she couldn't be in the same room with you. But she forgives you. My son has forgiven you. I've forgiven you. And so, and I'm sure Eric has forgiven you. I see an opportunity here, an opportunity to make something positive out of my son's death. And, and you're a part of it. We're all a part of that. When your trial starts in January, I told him I'll be at the courthouse, but I'll be outside picketing because I don't believe it's justice the death penalty would not bring me any satisfaction. That was Bob Otterby speaking to his son's killer, Edward Montour. Bob Otterby, can you talk about your response to this and then also explain what accounted for your change of heart on the question of the death penalty? Well, I've thought of nothing more for 11 and a half years. <laughs> and once I came back to my faith and started reading my Bible, I realized that was the best course to take. I'm very happy with that decision, and uh, my life has uh, improved immensely since that meeting. What was it like to meet with your son's killer, Eric, your son, a prison guard? You met with him as well as your other son, Eric's brother. Uh, well, my younger son wasn't going to meet Edward. He didn't feel he was ready for it. But as the meeting went on, my son stood up, he said, I feel God's presence in this room, and I want to be a part of it. So then he came to the table, and that really uh, made me happy because uh, the mercy and the love is starting to spread. And uh, if it starts with just one or two, it'll grow. Hmm. I want to bring Renee Feltz uh, into the conversation, uh, Democracy Now! producer. Uh, Renee Feltz, can you talk about what Bob's rights are to make a victim statement and uh, Colorado's constitutional amendment for victim rights and how this compares to other states? Well, it's just incredible, if you think about Bob's situation, Bob has his own lawyer to bring his voice into the courtroom. Usually in cases like this, it's the prosecution working with the victim's family who want to seek justice, and they're on the same page. So this is very unusual. In order to get his voice heard in this trial, he had to hire an outside lawyer. That lawyer presented an argument to the judge that he should be allowed to say to the jury, I oppose the death sentence for this man who killed my son. Uh, the judge recently said, in fact, you cannot do that. And the judge gave some reasons that relied on another case out of Oklahoma. And what's really, uh, and I can talk more about that, but what's really interesting about Colorado's law is that they 
1992 voted 80 percent of voters to amend their constitution to let victims like Bob say their piece in court in a victim's statement. In fact, they define victims as any natural person against whom a crime has been perpetrated or attempted, or if the person is dead, then their lawful representative like Bob. And this law says, and I can read from it here, that uh, the victim can inform the district attorney in the court in writing by a victim statement or by an oral statement of the harm that the victim has sustained as a result of crime with the determination of whether the victim makes a written input or oral or both to be made at the discretion of the victim. So here you have a judge saying, in fact, that he, he's not going to be allowed to testify. It's very unusual. Um, just to point out how this compares to some other laws around the country, in New Hampshire, it's quite interesting. In 2009, they passed a law there called the Crime Victims Equality Act. And that says that even if a crime victim, such as Bob, opposes the death sentence, the prosecutors are not allowed to attempt to ban them from saying their piece to the jury. Um, part of the reason this is interesting is because a jury is going to make the decision about what the ultimate punishment should be in this case. And they're not going to be able to hear from Bob directly that he doesn't want that punishment to be death. Renee, could you also explain, um, Edward Montour pled guilty in the original trial. Why was that conviction thrown out? Um, you know, part of the reason this case has been hard to cover for reporters is because it's complicated. But in the original trial, Bob uh, threw out his uh, court-appointed attorney, said, I want to represent myself, not Bob, actually, I should say Edward Montour, the killer. And he decided that he would represent himself, even though he was off his medication for being uh, bipolar and having psychosis uh, symptoms. Um, ultimately, uh, he also said, I just want the judge to make a decision. Well, it turns out that that's constitutionally invalid. A judge cannot issue a death penalty. It has to be a jury. So that was thrown out, and that's how we got back to square one. Uh, very quickly, I would just note that it's interesting, we noted uh, in the introduction that he was already in prison when uh, he ki uh, killed Bob's son. Why was he there? It's because he was accused of killing his own daughter when she was just months old. Um, and that, so he was sent back in the 90s to prison for this conviction as a so-called baby killer. That's a hard label to wear in prison. And um, it turns out that now uh, Edward Montour's current lawyers say that, in fact, that uh, that death may have actually been an accident, um, and it's incredible. But the uh, the uh, coroner's office has actually changed the cause of death in that death to uh, to undetermined instead of a homicide. So the very crime that landed Edward Montour in prison may have, in fact, uh, not have been a crime at all. Bob Audeby, do you plan to sit in on this trial? Uh, bits and pieces, uh, not. Not the whole trial. Uh, I tried that once, and uh, it just drove me to depression and anxiety. And uh, at that time, I didn't see justice being served. So if things turn around now, then I may make an appearance. You were a corrections officer yourself, and your son, of course, Eric, was a prison guard. That's where Edward Montour killed him. That's correct. And you said this, this experience uh, has made you very critical of the uh, prison system and the penal system in general. Could you talk about what specific changes you've been advocating in the Colorado prison system? Well, we've asked, uh, we suggested focus groups from the staff because the management has refused to listen to the people that are in the, in the trenches. And so a lot of things get by that uh, management does know, doesn't know anything about. Uh, we'd also, uh, we suggested different colored uh, jumpsuits for the inmates so violent offenders could be recognized immediately because right now in Colorado, we have violent and maximum security inmates in medium security facilities where they have no business. And unless you've read every jacket of every inmate, you don't know what they're in there for. So uh, I think the, the different colored uniforms would help. We've even suggested dogs to go on patrol with the officers rather than leaving them by themselves. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that could be done, but the, the administration refuses to listen. Renee. I, I wanted to suggest that Bob describe what he did in January, which was very interesting. He went to protest against the death penalty in this case outside of the courtroom when he wasn't quite sure if he would be allowed to make a statement inside. And Bob, could you talk about what, uh, who joined you? There were other victims of murder families that uh, were with you for that protest. Is that right? Can you talk about what you did and who joined you? 
That's correct. Uh, when I met with Brockler at my home, I told him that if he pursued the death penalty, that I would fight it, and, and I would pick it. That's the prosecutor in the case. Yes, and uh, he, I've been uh, picketing, and then uh, Tim Ricard, the husband of Mary Ricard, the second officer that was killed in Colorado recently, he's also anti-death penalty, and we've been working together. We had a survivor from uh, uh, one of the victims of Nathan Dunlop was also involved, and I met with the mother of that young lady, and we had a wonderful talk, and hope I was able to help her understand, you know, uh, you got to be willing to heal, and uh, you got to let the, let the hate go. I mean, uh, to me, the death penalty is a hate crime, and it's a crime against humanity. And uh, once you come to this side and see it for what it really is, then uh, you'll know you're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm.